back to the channel. I'm Chris. We're about to watch, um, apologize, I forgot their name. What is it? House of History. This is their Frederick the Great to Silesian, Silesian, Silesian Wars, whatever it was. I forgot. I apologize. Um, this one's, it's difficult. Uh, it's difficult for me to understand everything that he's saying. It's just the accent. Um, and I've tried to fix the sound, the headphones and everything. It's like a reverberation of the bass. So it's just not coming out too much. And I just don't want to use the closed captions. So I'm, I'm doing my best, but what is wrong with this? There, I'm doing my best, but it, it's. I'm oh, sorry. It's just difficult, but I'm trying. So this is part two, um, and it will run 14 minutes. So let's go ahead and jump into it. On the evening of May 16, 1742, Frederick II, King of Prussia, and his 10,000 strong army set up camp somewhere in Bohemia. The men lit their campfires and began cooking, while Frederick talked strategy with his officers. Then a messenger suddenly entered his camp. His horse, out of breath, he handed Frederick a letter written by his general, marching with the remainder of his army around one day's march behind him. The day before, Frederick passed a minor Austrian encampment nearby the town of Chotusitz. Thinking nothing of it, he continued his march. This letter, however, revealed the encampment they passed wasn't minor. It housed a 28,000 strong Habsburg army chasing Frederick. His general urged him to turn around immediately, as there was no doubt in his mind his army would face battle at the break of dawn. Uh -oh. After Frederick's victory at Molwitz, news traveled fast to all European courts. The small, insignificant Prussia managed to take on one of the greatest European dynasties. And they won. In the direct aftermath, Molwitz led to a chain of events resulting in the war of the Austrian succession. Planning rights, a period of diplomatic activity followed. Every power participating in the subsequent war had different interests. In short, the Habsburgs wanted to reclaim Silesia. Frederick wanted international recognition for his conquest of Silesia and especially not his fellow electorates of Saxony and Bavaria to gain anything at his expense. The interests of other powers were a bit more complex. Bavaria wanted its elector to become Holy Roman Emperor, and Saxony wanted to take whatever territories it could to link Poland-Lithuania with its electorate. France wanted to prevent Maria Theresa's husband from becoming Holy Roman Emperor, preferably while reducing the Habsburg dominions to a second-rate power. In May, Bavaria and Spain, with the... It's kind of amazing how every single one of them is all about themselves. I mean, it's it's like that today. You wish it wasn't, but it's... Gimme, 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 gimme. <laughs> I don't know why I was thinking it would be different, but... The port of France signed the Treaty of Nymphenburg. The treaty agreed to support the Bavarian elector's candidacy as Holy Roman Emperor. Later, Savoy Piedmont and Saxony joined the alliance. Finally, Prussia joined on June 4th, with France agreeing to send two French army corps, one to aid Prussia, one to invade Bohemia. Still, Frederick wanted Silesia, but he knew he would not benefit if Maria Theresa's lands were improperly dismembered. As such, he joined the alliance with a significant dose of suspicion. Despite his allies preparing for war, Frederick enjoyed a relatively quiet summer, welcoming reinforcements and, at best, enduring some cavalry skirmishes against Hungarian hussars. Then in August, the French army corps arrived. Contrary to Frederick's expectations, namely marching them to Vienna, a combined French-Saxon-Bavarian army focused on conquering Bohemia to secure the electoral vote for Charles of Bavaria. Frederick's allies didn't know that Frederick concluded a secret truce with General Nyberg on October 9th. The Habsburgs were in a desperate situation, losing ground every day. Frederick did not want to lose face towards his allies. As such, both parties concluded a verbal truce which stopped Prussia from making war without appearing to have stopped making war. Within a few <laughs> months, Frederick had already betrayed his alliance. 
and it would not be the last time. In November, a combined French-Bavarian-Saxon army captured Prague. One month later, Charles was crowned King of Bohemia. Then, securing this electoral vote, he was crowned Holy Roman Emperor in January 1742. Prussia had been relatively dormant during these developments. Realizing his allies were taking control of the situation, Frederick decided breaking the truce would be worth it to cement his position. In December, he invaded Bohemia and captured Tropau and Ulmutz. He betrayed Maria Theresa a second time. He rationalized it by stating the Austrians in fact broke the truce by leaking its existence to certain parties. Though things went well for Frederick for now, his allies faced tougher challenges. In January, a fresh army levied in large part from Hungary and Croatia under Field Marshal Count Ludwig Andreas Kevenhuller was determined to drive out the Habsburg enemies. From Vienna, he marched to Linz where he defeated the French General Segur. They continued their march west, capturing Munich, banning rights. In a twist of irony, the Bavarian elector was crowned emperor on that day in Frankfurt am Main. The first among European sovereigns had no state, no army and no resources. In the background, Frederick continued securing his hold on Silesia by defeating some defiant Austrian garrisons before marching into Moravia together with the 20,000-strong Saxon army. However, when they reached Brno, the Saxons refused to go any further. Their refusal was one of the many reasons Frederick referred to when publicly badmouthing his allies on many occasions. It would not bode well for the future. The constant harassment of supply and communication lines by Hungarian hussars and local irregulars led Frederick to try and squeeze the province as dry as he could before setting up his headquarters at Krudin. Facing hard times, Frederick reached out to Maria Theresa to see if she would be willing to accept another pact of neutrality. Considering his earlier violations and his callous invasion to begin with, she would not be fooled a third time. I was going to say, if she's stupid enough to sign it again, she should be invaded. <laughs> Sources conflict whether Maria Theresa sent an army to recapture Prague or to root out Frederick specifically. At any rate, in April, Austrian troops stationed in Bohemia received orders to link up with an army advancing. I would say she probably sent troops after Frederick himself. That's just my guess. Through Moravia, fielding an approximately 28,000 strong army under the commander Charles of Lorraine, they marched in Frederick's direction. Correspondence reveals Frederick was in the dark for the majority of the operation. It wasn't until May 10th he realized a powerful Austrian army marched in his direction. So he decided to split his army into two, taking them north. Frederick took 10,000 soldiers, while one day behind them followed 18,000 more under Leopold of Anhalt Dessau, son of Frederick's mentor, the old Dessauer. Frederick and Dessau figured they traveled far in advance of the Austrians. Then, on May 15, Frederick passed an Austrian encampment near the village of Chotusitz. He didn't think much of it. One day later, near Chotusitz, Dessau's rearguard engaged in a minor skirmish with Austrian cavalry. The experienced commander understood it wasn't just a random encampment or skirmish. It was, <laughs> in fact, Charles's entire army. Respecting the danger he was in, Dessau ordered his men on a grueling march towards Frederick to bridge the camp. He sent out several horse riders with the urgent message for Frederick to turn around and march towards him. That night at 2 a.m. his exhausted army occupied Chotusig, a small bohemian village. Riders returned with Frederick's reply, Dessau, was not to engage under any circumstances until Frederick arrived. Dessau commanded up to... So he's just going to stay in a defensive position There's a certain Frederick strain of bacteria called Lactobacillus ruteri that will help you grow bigger balls. There was a study published in 2014 that used male... All right, man. ...commanded up to 18,000 Prussian infantry. He deployed his men to the south of Chotusitz. He positioned his cavalry on both flanks with his left flank commanded by Lieutenant General von Waldorf. In front of the Zirkwitz pond, on his far right, stood 70-year-old Lieutenant General von Budenbrock. The cavalry consisted of heavy cuirassiers. Did I hear that right? 17-year-old? There's dragoons and light hussars. The positioning was done on purpose so that once Frederick arrived, he would find room to deploy his infantry. The infantry was comprised of both grenadiers and light infantry. 
Charles wanted to mount a charge before Frederick could deploy his army. Before dawn, he already deployed his infantry in two long lines in the center, flanked by two sizable cavalry contingents. The Austrian infantry wore the characteristic white coats with lapels, a tricorn hat equipped with muskets, bayonets, and small swords. The Austrian cavalry consisted of Hungarian hussars and traditional heavy Austrian cavalry. The left was commanded by General Karl Bacciani and the right by Wenzel, Prince of Liechtenstein. Before 7 a.m., Charles ordered his infantry lines to begin their march forward. Frederick and his 10,000 soldiers arrived around 7 a.m. A large body of Austrian soldiers advancing in the distance welcomed him. The Austrian artillery fired away at the Prussian positions, but the Austrians had no idea the king arrived. A large mound between Chotusitz and the Zerkwitz pond blocked their view. Still, Frederick felt he would not be able to properly deploy his army in time. As such, he ordered the artillery to fire at the Austrian positions. As the artillery fired, Hudenbrock received orders to charge against the Austrians and hamper their advance. The Prussian right charged straight towards the Austrian left flank. Bacciani ordered his cavalry to launch a counter charge. Both bodies of cavalry heavily damaged each other upon impact. An aggressive and cluttered melee ensued. According to some eyewitness accounts, the rising dust blinded the rear guard of the cavalry. The Prussian cavalry, inferior to the Austrians, endured the brunt of the damage. All the while, Frederick was still frantically deploying his army in the background. He learned from Molwitz that his incredibly disciplined infantry could once again make the difference in the face of adversity. Soon after, Wenzel's cavalry launched a charge against Waldo. Fighting took place on both the eastern and western sides of the battlefield. Among all this chaos, Charles' infantry marched forward towards Chotusitz. Under Dessau, the Prussian infantry launched a counter charge as Frederick's infantry was still not ready for combat. Because the Austrian infantry had already advanced quite a bit, it did not take long for Dessau's infantry to charge into them. Heavily outnumbered, ferocious fighting broke out. Dessau's troops were slowly pushed back into Chotusitz. And when the Austrians reached the outer row of wooden houses, they lit them on fire. The smoke made commanding the armies incredibly challenging. As fighting ensued on every front, part of Waldorf's cavalry broke from the melee and charged into the Austrian right flank. Infantry fired volleys at each other as the cavalry battled it out. Finally, Bacciani and Budenbrock's cavalry drifted off to the Austrian left, leaving that infantry flank entirely exposed. It wasn't until 10.30 a.m that Frederick finished deploying his infantry in a square. The fight had been going on for well over three hours at this point. Wow. Sources conflict, but Frederick's army numbered between 14 and 24 battalions. He managed to deploy them all without the Austrians realizing a large infantry body hid behind the mound. Upon Frederick's command, the infantry square marched forward towards the Austrian left flank. The Austrian infantry was incredibly surprised to suddenly see a massive body of infantry marched over the mound in a disciplined formation, moving like a wall. Flanking them entirely, they rapidly fired their volleys against the bewildered infantry. Before too long, part of the Austrian infantry began showing cracks. With an unguarded flank and facing fierce resistance from the infantry within Chotusitz, Charles decided the conditions weren't in his favor. Battling continued between both forces and there wasn't necessarily a side which gained the upper hand, but by the end of the morning, Charles ordered the general retreat. The Austrians managed to take most of their equipment with them, aside from a few heavy artillery pieces. Several officers reportedly urged Frederick to order a pursuit. However, he refused, considering his cavalry was still in disarray from the fighting and Wenzel's cavalry guarded the Austrian rear. As the Austrians retreated, it slowly became clear to the Prussians they had won the battle. In total, Prussia suffered 4,800 casualties, whereas Austria suffered 6,400, of whom many, if not most, were prisoners. Because Charles was allowed an orderly retreat, the Battle of Chotusitz did not prove to be a decisive victory for Prussia. Although, not militarily, because international developments would soon radically play into Frederick's favor. Despite not being a decisive victor, Austria's retreat certainly allowed Frederick to boast of his victory. Letters to friends reveal he exaggerated the number, stating the Prussians lost 1,200 at best, whereas the Austrians lost up to seven times as many men. Trolls managed to coordinate a stable retreat. History is written by the winners, right? 
say whatever he wants and people will believe it. Whereas he was able to take up arms against Frederick again in Vienna, where he got the best of Maria Theresa and her advisors, not to mention the empty treasury. If the Habsburgs wanted to defeat France, they could not have that pesky Frederick taking up resources. As such, they finally caved to another round of diplomatic talks with Frederick. The British presided over the peace talks, agreeing to pay a significant sum for Maria Theresa to cede Silesia. The British had no interest in the balance of power on the European mainland being upset. On June 11th, both parties signed the preliminary peace at Breslau. The final treaty was signed on July 28th in Berlin. The Austrians were only willing to cede Silesia if Frederick became its sovereign due. The king reportedly replied, I don't give a fuck about titles, as long as I get the territory. He now <laughs> left his former wow. allies, the French, Bavarians and Saxons, to fight against the Habsburgs without him. His sudden withdrawal from the war was again a massive blow to his former allies. It was the second time he betrayed them in a very short period. Despite the peace treaty, neither side expected the peace to last indefinitely. Maria Theresa knew that she would have her vengeance once she beat the French. And Frederick understood this all too well. And as soon as the peace was signed, he began restocking his depleted treasury and rebuilding his army. All the while he strengthened his new fortresses in Silesia against a possible invasion. I'm going to end this here. This is part two. <clears throat> um, it's a little better to, to kind of understand. Probably because I haven't been drinking today. <laughs> All right. Well, I have been. I drank earlier. I'm good. All right. Well, I'm going to end this here. Um, I think I'm going to jump back into this one and get part three done. This is pretty good. I was going to comment, and I, I forgot. When the charge happens and then the retreat I kind of I so, uh, um, in one of the Napoleon videos someone made a comment you gotta understand you know there you can't really you can't you can't charge and then withdraw because all those bodies that was a wasted effort and that's what I see here I see that the guy didn't um, don't remember the name now charged in against Frederick's people and then Frederick three hours later the guy had three hours and then Frederick charges in and then the guy has to retreat like you got to feel like that's a waste of all those lives and everything so I get that now I understand that a little bit more if you're defending yourself from an attack and you retreat that's one thing but you know you initiated it and then you lost the battle by leaving like that was a waste so anyways I'm gonna end this here I just had to make that comment um, yeah uh, until the next video have a good day have a good night